Can I start? Okay, right. So uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. I can't tell you how nice it is to be coming to an actual in-person meeting nowadays. Um, and especially here, which I always like to come to. So I'm going to talk about uh, some work I've done with Keith Dines about uh, understanding the Higgs mass, but from a string theory viewpoint. So we are not really in the business of model building or anything like that. We just want to understand what happens to something like a Higgs mass in a UV complete theory. So this is our motivation. Uh, of course, you're all very familiar with it, but I'm going to recap it anyway. Uh, so as you know, uh, the Higgs is one of the uh, least well-behaved fields in the standard model. Uh, and uh, the way that you can see it, one way you can see it is to construct its effective potential. So I've just taken this directly from Coleman Weinberg's paper. You write all of your diagrams like that, and you find that when you write, when you find the potential, so I'm going to call refer to it as the cosmological constant, the potential. When I write the potential, you find that you need cutoffs, and you have a quadratic dependence on the cutoff. There, which is a leading term, and it's proportional to, to then the super trace of the mass squared in the spectrum. And then also, uh, you have a logarithmic term, which is uh, indicating that uh, when I take its derivative, it's going to tell me that the Higgs mass is going to be running as well. So not only is the Higgs UV sensitive maximally, but it's also sensitive to the infrared of the theory. So it's the, the canary and the coal mine. I, I don't know if this expression is used in other countries or if Britain was the cruelest country. What's that? Oh, so this is a coal miner. And this, is a, this is a canary. And you would totally take the canary down with the intention that, that it's the first thing to die if there's a problem rather than you. So, so that's the, the role of the Higgs. It, the Higgs dies first, basically. So we're interested in looking at what happens in a full theory, in a string theory. Uh, and uh, our sort of starting position is that if you suppose, if you assume that nature is based on a closed string theory, whatever it is that makes the theory finite has to be there even today. And the thing which makes string theory finite is not supersymmetry, but modular invariance. So modular invariance is the thing which, and I'll, I'll show you how, renders all the diagrams finite uh, in quotation marks, so it's finite up to infrared divergences. Uh, in most string phenomenology, you don't, uh, you don't really think like that. What you do is at the beginning, you begin with something like a supersymmetry, and then you'll jump to the effect of field theory, and you'll throw away, at that point, modular invariance. Most of the string phenomenology will do that. So you're kind of abandoning the beautiful thing which was at work making it all finite and so you, you kind of lose any potential lessons that you might be able to learn now as i said you know if you assume that the, the uh, universe is based on a closed string theory the world today uh, is is still operating with that symmetry underlying so it has to still be finite so there should still be modular invariance in the theory and then the question is how what does it tell us what does that modular invariance tell us about, in particular, the effective potential? And um, a sort of related question is, as, as we'll find out, string theory is heavily UVIR mixed, <coughs> sort of maximally mixed. Uh, and so it's not obvious how an effective field theory emerges. You know, I can, I can pull it out by hand, but when I do it, I break modular invariance. So, you know, oh, this game over, basically. So, um, so I, I'm going to, yeah, this statement is relatively controversial, but I, I think it's correct. No one, as far as I can see, has written down an equivalent of the Coleman Weinberg potential for string theory. So that is, tell me what the potential should look like in terms of its mass spectrum. You know, I don't want to know what the model is that you're interested in. I just want to know what it looks like in terms of masses M. Uh, and, and as far as I know, no one has done that. So that was our objective, and that's what I'll show you at the end. And my objective really is, I don't want to focus on any particular model. I just want to say something general for modular invariant theories. Right, so it'll take a little bit of uh, 
explanation how we get there because there are some you know so i mentioned number theory it's not something that uh, we physicists tend to carry around in our heads very much number theory so um i'll, I'll have to explain a few things on the way and so it's a little bit of a trail so so do try and uh, keep up and i'll try and complete the trail in 30 minutes uh, so there, there are three parts to the talk so uh, so first of all i'll talk about the effective potential of field theory, but I'll write it for you in a, in a very stringy way. And then I'll show you what happens in string theory then, which will look hopefully moderately familiar by that point. And I'll show you how modular invariance affects the answer that you get. And then finally, I'll talk about renormalization, which is something we'll have to get to. All right, so let me begin at the beginning with the effective potential. Of particle theories, and I'm going to write it, I'm going to derive it in a very stringy way. And by stringy, I really mean kind of first quantized, if you like. And so, uh, so this is the diagram that we're doing. It's the most trivial diagram you can imagine. Uh, it's a propagator closed on itself. And as Coleman and Weinberg showed us, uh, uh, due to symmetry factors, you end up getting a logarithm of the propagators integrating over the momentum and what i'm going to do is i'm just going to shuffle around that thing and so i can write the logarithm as an integral over some dummy variable t of an exponential and then i can take the momentum integrals and i end up with something looks like that so that is what that's something which you would call the first quantized way of writing the um of writing the uh, potential and uh, and this parameter t is really parameterized, telling you the size of the circle essentially, and it's uh, the Schwinger world line parameter. If you know your first quantized field theories, uh, I can also, and I'm going to identify for later this combination that appears. So it appeared inside this integral there. I'm going to call it G, and I'm going to call that the particle partition function. So this is a weighted sum over the density of states. So the states uh, have masses m. And of course, eventually, ultimately, these M's are going to be the M's we're interested in. They're going to contain the Higgs's in there. Uh, and it has this prefactor 1 over T. So that is the particle partition function which, which is appearing. And you'll notice I had to put cutoffs on this integral T. And so there's a potential infrared cutoff uh, in, if there are massless states. Uh, that's at T goes to infinity. And the ultraviolet is at T goes to zero, where there's a, a quadratic divergence. Anyway, you do the integral and you get the answer. So that's the so a simple way of doing the uh, effective potential, getting the effective potential. And then uh, if I want to know, for example, what a Higgs mass squared looks like, I would uh, take its double derivative like that. So you see that you'll get, ultimately, I should now replace this logarithm with some energy scale, subtract something, and it's going to be running, as well as having this, uh, this divergence there. Right, okay, so that is the particle story. So now let's go to the string theory version of that. Uh, and I just want to show you in sort of very generic terms what it will look like. And, and most one-loop diagrams uh, in string theory will look pretty similar to what I'm going to show you. So a closed string theory is what I'm going to assume. Uh, so the diagram is now a donut. It has two uh, parameters that describe the radii of it. And uh, what you do traditionally is you project this thing down to the plane using conformal invariance, and then uh, you define the shape of the torus with a single complex parameter tau. So that's defining the torus. And then you notice that if I do tau goes to tau plus one, uh, so I get this parallelogram instead of that parallelogram, it's the same torus. So I had better divide out by those transformations. And those transformations, uh, uh, fill, uh, generate the modular group for you, those two transformations. So tau goes to tau plus one, tau goes to minus one over tau. It's just basically redefining what the torus is, uh, but it's the same torus. So we divide out by that, and you get this famous diagram where there's a fundamental domain in the tau plane. Uh, and now our tau is, of course, it's playing the same role as the Schwinger parameter does in the particle theory. So we need to integrate over all taus up to those transformations. So you're left with this fundamental domain. So this so far is textbook one loop, if you got that far in string theory, it's textbook one loop string theory. 
uh, you end up with a fundamental domain. And you can see on the, in the fundamental domain, when I go to large imaginary tau, that's the same thing as the infrared. And so it will generate for me things that look like a particle theory. Uh, meanwhile, the ultraviolet and what you were, what you were say in the, in the textbooks, oh my goodness, the ultraviolet has disappeared. So uh, therefore everything is regular. And so the story is not quite that simple, but anyway, let me show you what happened. So, so first of all, I'm going to do the integral for you. So, so the tau, I'm going to write as tau 1 plus i tau 2. So my Schwinger parameter now will be tau 2. So that's the imaginary part of tau. I'm also going to define purely m, which is a string scale. It's 1 over alpha prime, uh, 4 pi squared alpha prime also m string squared on four pi squared. So it's a reduced string scale, essentially. So this is what the integral over the fundamental domain will look like. So here I've got a measure. So this is a modular invariant measure, a two-dimensional measure. Curly f was the fundamental domain. So that's what I'm going to integrate over. And then I've got some function inside. And that function inside is the string equivalent of the particle partition function. And my job is to find a function which is modular invariant. And there are not so many of those, so it, the number of string theories I can write down that are consistent is quite limited, relative, well, relatively limited, depending on what, how many dimensions you're in. The way you typically write it is that you write this modular invariant function. So now you see we're, we're really getting into number theory a little bit. Modular invariant functions I write in terms of this, uh, this parameter called the gnome which is e to the two by i tau. And there's a theorem, which is that any modular invariant function, I can write as an expansion in this parameter q and it's conjugate q bar. So it looks like that. And m and n are called the levels normally. And so this is the sort of little miracle that you find when I do the tau one integral. So if I'm, if I'm at large tau two, so in the infrared, I integrate across, I project to uh, the states where m is equal to n. So those are called the level matched ones. And typically people will call them the physical states. You get this thing in d dimensions, which you recognize is pretty much the same as was there in the particle theory. Right, so the string theory will give you the particle theory uh, low in the infrared. So that looks pretty encouraging. All right. So now, that, so so far, all of this is relatively standard uh, uh, string theory. So now I'm going to write something which is going to probably be less familiar to you, uh, but it's very familiar to the number theory people. Yeah. Oh, um, so what's... Um, which, uh, sorry, which bit? Oh, I'm uh, sorry. Um, yeah, this is, this is uh, the, the, it's the mass of the state. So it's basically whatever is appearing here in the... Yeah, the, that's right. But it's, uh, it's all absorbed into the mass squared. So whatever, so the M's and the M's are the level and they define the mass squared for you. Yeah. So it's a, it's a whatever, whatever appears in the exponent, you can identify as mass square, yeah. Right, so this is going to probably be less familiar to you, which is that that integral, I can actually write as a super trace over the entire spectrum. Uh, and this is an identity, uh, which you can prove. And it, it's a, a kind of very number theoretical thing. Uh, it's a, it's a lambda, it can be written like that. The super trace is now over the entire infinite spectrum of the theory, whatever it happens to be. So I don't need to tell you what model it is. As long as the theory is modular invariant, I can write the lambda integral like that. I can write lambda like that. Uh, and, th and this is uh, uh, kind of miraculous because if I take a completely non-supersymmetric string theory, so uh, as long as it has no tachyons, uh, so for example, SO16 cross SO16, for example, uh, and I show you its spectrum, its spectrum will look like this. So what I'm plotting here, you, you may not be able to see that the axis here, it's the logarithm of the number, of the net number. So it's a number of bosons minus number of fermions multiplied by the sign. So there's an excess of bosons up here, an excess of fermions down there. This is the level. So this is the mass squared essentially here. And, and this is an actual theory, a, a, a broken, a supersymmetric broken string theory. 
and you'll see that these numbers are enormous. So this is this is the logarithm. You see, this is 10, 20, 30, and so on. So this thing is blowing up in terms of the number of states, or even the difference in the number of states. Uh, so bosons minus femur is blowing up, and so the spectrum is completely crazy all the way up to infinity. But because of modular invariance, I can write it like that, and the answer is finite. That sum is finite. So I, I'm just going to give you a little uh, kind of indication of how you get there, uh, because it will uh, it will kind of inform the way we think about things a little bit. So this is the integral that we're doing. So this to get this identity. What I've shown you is a supertrace expression, which is uh, an expression in terms of the physical states in the theory, so the level matched ones. Those things, those states, are when I do the tau one integral all across. So somehow, to get this identity with some kind of number theory tricks uh, unfolding and so on, uh, which was known since 1940, incidentally, if you think this is a string theory uh, regime we're in here, um, so uh, what you're doing is taking this fundamental domain and you're mapping it, and I, I don't know if you can see that this is a different color, but this strip between minus one and one all the way down to zero, we're mapping this domain by, uh, we're recasting the integral into another integral, which is an integral over the, uh, the critical strip it's called. So that's the strip all the way down to zero between minus a half and a half. And so there are various techniques uh, that you can uh, that you can ask me about, but uh, so unfolding is the is a generic name for it. But Rankin Solberg method, for example. Yeah. So uh, so if you think about that, and and what we're actually looking at, which is this function g, which is the number of states in the theory, what the the fact that this supertrace is finite tells you is that this function, this g. The partition function, so this is the particle partition function, so counting the number of states in the theory. In a string theory, this thing goes to a constant when tau 2 goes to zero. So in the deep ultraviolet, the leading term, the supertrace, if I tailor expand this thing, the leading term is going to be zero. So in other words, supertrace of one, just counting the number of states, supertrace of one equals zero. Uh, so that's the miracle of these theories. Despite the spectrum looking completely crazy, supertrace one equals zero. Something else you often hear is that it's behaving like a two dimensional theory in the UV. And the reason people say that is because this prefactor is actually, uh, this is for four dimensions. In two dimensions, there's no tear two there, it's just constant. So then, then people say it becomes a two dimensional theory in the, in the UV. I really prefer this that supertrace one is zero, is, the, you know, is what's actually. The, the main thing. So this goes by various different names. So uh, Keith Dines called this misaligned supersymmetry, this fact. Uh, people also called it asymptotic supersymmetry. I re would really not like the name supersymmetry to be attached to this phenomenon at all, because it's nothing to do with supersymmetry, really. But anyway. Right, so one thing that you can appreciate by that, uh, by the fact that we end up with an integral over the political strip here, is that when I do an integral like that, I can't identify any particular cusp, you know, large tau two, small tau two. I can't identify anything as the UV or the IR. Right? Every cusp is playing exactly the same role, and there's a kind of democracy, if you like. There's no, there's nothing I can point to and say this is the UV end, this is the IR end. Um, and so it's a, an important. Uh, one point to bear in mind that before we actually do anything, the theory doesn't really know which is the UV and which is the IR. Right, so now let's turn to the Higgs itself. So that's uh, that's sort of the general layout. So now the Higgs, if I want to do the Higgs, I can kind of copy what I can do in the part of the theory and just try and take its double Higgs derivative, so a double phi derivative. If I double differentiate the Z, so the partition function, that I have in lambda in order to do this, I pull down this factor, which has to kind of go in there inside the sum. Uh, and this is almost everything I need, except not quite. And so when I take derivatives, the thing I have to remember is that 
when I uh, take a derivative with the Higgs, the Higgs is playing the role at, in a modular invariant theory. It's shifting everything in the modular functions, and it's playing the role of, of a coordinate in the modular functions. And so if I take derivatives, I lose modular invariance if I'm not careful. What happens is I pick up an anomaly, a modular anomaly, which I have to cancel. So as well as that thing, which is the naive contribution, like the thing you would guess if I take a double derivative, I have to add a universal term to restore modular invariance. Um, and so, I mean, this is generally true for any modular invariant theory, even today, if, if the theory is still a closed string theory today. Uh, it, this sort of thing has been observed in uh, sort of phenomenological discussions from way back when, that you always get a cosmodular constant contribution, and, and typically it's associated with space-time modular symmetry, not world sheet modular symmetry, but you can identify it very generally this way. So, uh, so we're ready to go, we put everything in, we do our integral, and this is what we get. So we get the first terms, so this term looks the same as you would have expected, so this is just double derivative of the string result, the lambda. This is the anomaly cancelling term, so that is proportional to, to the one loop cosmodular constant itself. Right, so that's that's fine. We add that as well, and then we get either we get infinity if the mass is a zero, or we get zero if the states have a mass. Right, so we've done something wrong. The thing we've done wrong, we forgot that. Of course, if I'm thinking about the Higgs mass squared, it has a logarithm and it's going to be running. Uh, we we forgot about that, and the theory doesn't know. Uh, if I'm supposed to call a state massless or massive, so all it does is it returns zero or infinity until I put an energy scale in, right? So I've not actually inserted an energy scale. So we need to think about renormalization. So you see, this is why it's quite a trail. I mean, I'm showing you what it took us two, two years, this trail to complete. I'm, I'm doing it in 30 minutes for you. Right. Okay, so uh, we have to look at uh, inserting a, an IR, a, a regularization scale. So I want to do something like a Wilsonian, and I'm going to cut off modes, below some energy scale mu. So I want to do something like that to introduce an energy scale and extract a physical running. And again, we have to then differ from what people normally do in spring phenomenology, because normally what you do is you calculate a string, uh, you, you calculate the whole thing, you notice that there's something diverging. Uh, you, it's diverging because the state is massless or light, so you then extract that thing, you subtract it, you say, this is my effective theory, what's left I'm going to call a threshold correction. So that's what you typically do to try and separate things. In the string theory, you see that operation breaks modular invariance, so I, I, I'm not going to do that. I'm not allowed to do that if I'm going to preserve modular invariance. What I can do instead is I can take an integral, so this is just a generic integral, like integral of some function f, modular invariant function f, and I can insert a regulator g at, and what this thing does, this regulator, it crushes everything below a certain scale mu. And so that is a way to introduce a uh, scale, an energy scale into my integral. And so that's how we're going to introduce a renormalization scale. So you can see what properties this G hat should have if it's going to be consistent. And there, there's three. Um, so this regulator that I'm going to introduce an energy scale with, it should itself be modular invariant. Right? So I don't ever want to get rid of modular invariance. I want to stay in the modular invariant theory. So G that I insert is also modular invariant. It should look like this roughly, so it should go to one at large values, and it, it should crush everything below some scale mu. And so I can, I can interpret a, a certain position in tau two as that scale, as the energy scale, one over mu squared. So in other words, this is infrared up here, and this is ultraviolet down there. There's one final thing, which is that I want to interpret the theory as, uh, as something where every cusp is playing the same role. I don't want to select a cusp to be my infrared. They're all contributing equivalently, which means that uh, tau two star, so that is the cutoff scale, it, everything should be invariant under modular transformations of that thing as well. So in other words, uh, this function should be invariant when mu goes to m string squared over mu. 
right? So if I do it that, if I do that, I'm crushing things not only in the fundamental domain, but also I let all of the infinite number of cusps down here as well. Right? So every cusp is crushed, essentially. Well, okay, so in order to do it, we uh, borrowed something from uh, uh, people in the audience, or one person in the audience. Uh, so, uh, Karitsis, Kunas, Petrofus, Rizzo, uh, they worked on this a long time ago. Um, and uh, what they introduced is a function which does just that. So, it's a regulator which will crush things in a modular invariant way. And it's based on the circle partition function. So, the circle partition function, it's just another modular invariant function. Uh, right, so it has to be modulate invariant. It has some uh, scale in it, which is a radius, so it's a compactification radius. Uh, they derived this uh, from, from geometric arguments. And uh, what, we're, what we did, we borrowed that thing and we inserted the final, the third property, which it doesn't have originally, but, uh, but what you have to do, you take that result and multiply it by this prefactor one over one plus two a squared. And then this G hat has all of the properties so you have to take the derivative with respect to A of the difference of two Z circs. That has the properties that we want. So I'm plotting this G, G hat for various values of A here. So A is related to mu like that. So A and mu are, are kind of roughly the same. So it's roughly the properties you want. See, it's not quite, it has a bit of a lump, but it doesn't really matter. We just want to make sure everything's crushed in the infrared. Right, okay, so then finally we're ready to get the answer, and this is what you get. So the mass squared that you get for your state now, so it has the original thing, so it has the cosmology of constants, so this is the modular anomaly cancelling term, and then everything else I can write as a double derivative of something which I can call lambda hat. A lambda hat is a regulated lambda, so that is as if I took the original cosmology of constant, and even though it's finite, I decide to regulate that as well at the same scale mu. So I remove all of the light modes from that as well below mu. And I take its double derivative. That gives me the answer, right? So actually initially when we were doing this, we were starting by doing two point functions and so on. And then we just realized, okay, the answer at the end, is really just a double derivative of a function that looks like that. Uh, what I'm showing you is it, it's an approximation to the actual result. The actual result is an infinite sum of Bessel functions. So it's a quite a complicated looking thing, which is a sum, a trace over the masses, over functions of masses. But it approximates very well to this. So you see that when you have any state which is lighter than mu, it will contribute something to this potential, which looks as if it ran up from its mass. Right? So it contributes a logarithm. Uh, as long as the Higgs couples to it, it contributes a logarithm as if it ran up to the scale mu from its mass n. As soon as mu goes above its mass, it's exponentially squashed and it doesn't contribute at all. So this, so you get something that looks like a running effective theory. And, it, and where it runs to is the answer that you would get for lambda if I didn't regulate it at all. So in the infrared, the uh, the potential it run it runs to the answer the naive answer if I don't regulate it. This result and the, the infinite sum of Bessel functions, which uh, this 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 margin is not large enough to display. So the infinite sum of Bessel functions um, is a fully complete effective potential UV, UV complete effective potential, and it all it depends on is that the theory is modular invariant. It just depends on modular invariance. Uh, and it, it does everything that you need it to do. So below the mass of, uh, of states, they fall out of the running. Um, but when they're in the effective theory, then they will contribute as if they were running logarithmically up from their mass. And by construction, when we uh, put in our regulator, it, everything is symmetric. So you end up with this sort of diagram. You end up with this diagram. This, uh, what, I'm, what I'm showing here on this axis is, this, is the energy scale. The most UV possible is mu equals M string, which is kind of in the middle. Uh, so remember, we have mu goes to M string squared over mu as a symmetry. So it, everything reflects around there. So what happens is uh, in the deep infrared, I, I asymptote to uh, the, the unquenched answer. Right? I asymptote the unquenched answer. As I start to rise above, the energy scale goes above the, the scale of masses. 
things start to run logarithmically. As I reach the string scale, it has to somehow turn over and then do the opposite thing on this side. Because at this side, this is the ultra ultraviolet. So uh, we're no longer really dealing with anything like a, an effective field view. It's just going to be, from our low, low scale point of view, it's at this, at this end of things, what we're talking about is going to be quite a mess. But, uh, but everything here behaves exactly as it would in the kind of naive effective field theory in these regions between the string scale and the infrared where things freeze out. Right, okay, so let me conclude. <laughs> um, so uh, in this talk, I was talking about a general supertrace formula for the Higgs. Uh, and to, in order to derive an effective potential, which plays the same role as the particle effective potential that you all know and love. And so that is something that's written only in terms of the mass spectrum. Right? So regardless of, the, of what the model is, if your theory is modular invariant, its potential will be doing something like that. And this modular invariant regulator uh, of John and Lenz is very clever. Uh, and so, so we're able to adapt it and, uh, and we, we're going to insert a Wilsonian cutoff using it uh, and get a good definition of, of renormalization scale, even though the theory is completely UVI or mixed. And so it looks like it's quite problematic to do that. One thing that you probably noticed is uh, the, the full potential, it, it looks kind of like the sum of an infinite tower of particle potentials. So that's, that's one way to think of what's going on. Uh, and then something else, uh, okay, well, let me skip to the end because I'm running over a bit. But I, I think this, we think it should be relevant for many phenomenology, phenomenology ideas. So for example, you may be familiar with this naturalness condition of Veltman, which is that this quadratic divergence should be zero. Uh, in the string theory, you get an equivalent, uh, but it's not the supertrace over the effective theory, it's the full theory. So the full supertrace of the full UV complete theory is the thing that should be zero, if you're going to believe that. Anyway, I'll leave it. Oh, yeah, it's, a, it's almost, it's small, it must be small. I can try to define an official uh, uh, theory in a sense. Could we report kind of a field which is the Higgs? Yeah. Now, can you try to do it in a particular example? So, this is there have been computations. Some uh, examples of the of some fields in that case with tracking. Um, can you adapt your, your, your method to, for this particular case? Yeah, so I, I, okay, I'm not sure about a particular physical example you think of, but uh, question, I mean, I, it, but you're worried, are you worried that it's a first quantized versus second quantized issue? But, yeah, because, yeah. I mean, if, you, if you can do it off cell, you do. Yeah. Uh, it's like a slow field theory, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. So, so one thing that we, we're relying heavily on here when I write down everything is that uh, where the Higgs appears in the theory, it has to appear inside a modular function. And the only place it can be there is a, as a coordinate of modular functions. So uh, we're still kind of uh, using the language, the one, uh, the first quantized language. Um, and we're doing first quantized like two point functions, for example, but where our Higgs is appearing there um, as, a, uh, as a kind of parameter in the modular functions. So the, the Higgs appear, so when I take derivatives with respect to the Higgs, this probably disturbs you a little bit. Those, those, uh, they, I, there I'm thinking really is the Higgs as a deformation of a modular functions. Uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it would be, I, I, it would be good to actually do it in a second quantized way. Professor Zopanos. Uh, as you remember, uh, as you mentioned it in Veltman's condition, uh, we used to get the, uh, uh, you know, the mass square of the Higgs, uh, versus the mass of the top and so on. Uh, could you do something similar? I mean, assuming the low energy is the standard model, could you 
predict, I suppose, now the string scale or something? Yeah, so, so this, this expression, even though it looks similar, it's hiding a multitude of sins because what we're doing is we're kind of, we're sitting in the final vacuum, right? So everything is broken, it, gut symmetries are broken. We're sitting in the final vacuum. When I, when I calculate this thing, uh, I had better have the masses of all of the things uh, when I'm sitting in the final vacuum. So all of the gut states, for example, will have to appear with their gut, broken gut masses and so on. Um, yeah, so the condition would be very hard to write down for a full UV complete theory. Yeah, it's a little bit uh, reverses things on its head a bit because we're sitting in the vacuum that we end up in when we when we write this thing. You know, the question of how you can construct something in order to do that is uh, is uh, complicated. Well, Apostolos, the last question. Uh, ordinary theories, you have a super trace M4, right? So as far as I see from your derivation, uh, or you are only getting a, or working from a potential super trace M square. I mean, and uh, is that because of module? And then you, of course, you have this super trace one, which is zero. Is that uh, a reason for this absence of this extra term on the modular symmetry or? Oh, um if it's that, that means that uh, the mass spectrum of the scalars and the fermions cannot be arbitrary. They have to be. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's. Oh, yeah, that's right. But the relations are very, um, you know, they're not obvious to see from the spectrum. So, in order to get the results, you know, you would have to go through some sort of procedure like Poisson resummation or something, and you would see that things are very uh, cancelling. But you can't see it just by looking at the spectrum. There's no level by level cancellation, essentially, when it's modular invariant. But yeah, the cancellation is still there. So that's. That means super trace M4 goes away. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's the same. It's, a, it's a, exactly that's what's happening here. Okay, so I think we should stop the discussion at this point. Let's thank Steve again for his presentation. <laughs> The, the next uh, the next talk will be given by John Rizos from University of Ioannina. The title is on non supersymmetric Patti Salam string models. Okay, I guess we are ready. Let's start. Nadia, Nadia. Nadia. Okay, I think we are ready. Oh. Okay, I have to be somewhere here. Okay, I, I'm very glad to be in Corfu for, for us more among the friends and the colleagues. Corfu is a place actually I grew up until the age of 18, so it's always a pleasure to be here in Corfu. 
So what I will talk today is actually um, um, relevant to the previous talk. And this is a talk on motion symmetric Patricia Lam string models. I think the model one is a problem, no? no? It's okay? So this is uh, work in collaboration with Yanis uh, Florakis and Konstantinos uh, Giolaris in Ioannina, the previous uh, papers and the work in progress. So what I'm trying to discuss is, uh, actually what I'm going to present is uh, some specific uh, non supersymmetric uh, string models. And I'm going to be based on uh, Pati Salam uh, Gates Group, which is which was one of the first, actually, non supersymmetric GATT uh, uh, models. Uh, I'm going to consider uh, supersymmetry breaking in the context of string theory via the sex fault uh, compactifi uh, compactification. Uh, I'm going to construct some models and uh, to calculate the one loop potential and discuss about the cosmological constant. And then I will give my conclusions. So let me give a very brief introduction. The standard model of uh, particle physics uh, is very successful in uh, interpreting experimental results. However, it is considered today as an effective theory because uh, the standard model doesn't answer some of the questions like uh, charge quantization, neutrino masses, dark matter, uh, matter and, another, and, uh, and last but not least, the gravity does not include the gravity. Supersymmetry is a very compelling expansion, uh, um, extension of the standard model. However, so excuse me for interrupting. I cannot see the slides. We cannot see the slides. Can someone share the slides, please? Nothing is uh, going on here. Yeah, now it's okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, that could help us to resolve some of these problems. Now, uh, also, the introduction of SUSE at a few TV with minimal content can also lead to coupling unification. However, as of today, the experiments cannot provide any evidence uh, for, in favor of supersymmetry. So, one is forced to consider uh, alternative uh, scenarios. Now, in the context of, of uh, string theory, we have uh, string phenomenology for very long now, but people have mainly concentrated on supersymmetric models. Uh, however, space-time supersymmetry is not uh, required for consistency in string theory. From the very early days of the first uh, string revolution, it was known that the heterotic strings uh, in 10 dimensions com uh, comprise the supersymmetric E8, cross E8, and the so 32 but also the non-supersymmetric tachyon free model which is the SO16 cross SO16 theory. However, non supersymmetric string phenomenology has not received much attention until recently. And uh, between the, uh, among the groups who have worked on this is, is also the previous speaker, uh, Steve, uh, is one of, uh, of the groups that uh, have worked on the subject. So, why people don't work on uh, supersymmetric, uh, non supersymmetric string models? Because any scenario of supersymmetry breaking in the context of string theory has to address some important issues, as to resolve the MW over the plus hierarchy, compatibility with gauge coupling unification, uh, accounts for the smallness of the cosmological constant, resolve possible instability stachyons, and stabilize, finally stabilize the moduli. Among them, the most important thing is that the cosmological constant, because as soon as you abandon supersymmetry, you don't have zero cosmological constant anymore. So this is a very serious problem. And I'm going to focus a bit on this problem. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to construct some string models, which also incorporate a choosy breaking via the self charge uh, compactification mechanism. Uh, the self charge compactification is an elegant mechanism to break choosy in the context of string theory. A minimal implementation would involve uh, an extra dimension, let's call it X5, and the concepts uh, and the concept size, let's call it Q. We compactify this dimension X5, but upon compactification, we don't uh, we don't ask just the fee to be 
phi of uh, x5 plus uh, 2 pi equal to phi of x5, but of x5 we, we, we ask uh, to be commodified upon the, the, the action of this operator. This way, we, we obtain a 50 tower of Kaluga Klein states for the charge fields. For example, we have a mass gap for the charge field, for the charge field, and we have a tower of Kaluga Klein states. This can be utilized quite uh, easily in the case of uh, two being the further number, because if we do so, it leads to a different masses, to different masses for fermions and bosons which initially was, were lying in the same supermultiplet, and thus to uh, breaking of supersymmetry. In this scenario, the surely breaking is related to the compactification radius, which is one over R. So somehow we are to higher dimensions, and then we compactify these dimensions upon the action of this operator. And this way, we obtain a mass gap between fermions and bosons. Uh, in this scenario, the gravitino, in this scenario, uh, if we consider, for example, uh, compactification of six internal dimensions in three separate tutori parameterized by TIUI, which is the standard parameterization uh, of the torus in the string theory. And if we assume for simplicity that we, 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 we implement the set fault in uh, the first torus, P1, U1, then the gravitino receives a mass exactly one over R1 for the case of a square torus, which is the simplest case. All moduli, Ti and Ui, which are the moduli of the three torus, uh, Ti, remain much less at 3 level. Of course, at the limit, R1 goes to infinity, we have M3 half equals zero, and supersymmetry is restored. So this is in a, in a very few words in uh, the sex phase uh, mechanism I'm going to utilize in this uh, scenario. So now if we go to the one loop partition function, the partition function, uh, Steve has also discussed this previously. It can be written this way. These are actually the, uh, the, the internal fermions, this is the lattice, this is the, the three tori, and these are the, the fermions. I'm, I'm going to consider a fermionic uh, formulation for the string theory. And now, and now I can write down the full partition function of a general model. The information about the model actually is, uh, lies inside this, uh, this phase phi. And the sex fast breaking is implemented using uh, a modified lattice, which is actually a shifted lattice instead of the normal lattice. So I take the partition function, and instead of the normal lattice, three lattices here, I use, I use the shifted lattices. And this, in this way, I implement the sex fast mechanism in the case of uh, string theory. Then I have to go to the one loop potential. The one loop potential uh, involves an integration over the fundamental, do fundamental domain. Uh, Steve has talked about this before. And uh, you have to do this integral in order to calculate the, the modular dependence of this uh, one loop potential. In principle, uh, this will give you uh, for generic values of the moduli, this will give you a, fu a function of uh, Q and Q bar, and you, and you get an expansion. And as uh, Steve explained, uh, this expansion uh, involves uh, very big, big numbers, and it's uh, alternating series of uh, positive and negative. And if you try really to, to compute it, it's uh, very hard because uh, you have to sum up big terms, and you have to, ask, to, to be sure that the convergence is somehow assured. The convergence is, of course, because of the of the terms uh, of this term, which at, a, at some limit gives you a convergent partition function. So, in principle, for generic uh, values of the moduli and for a generic uh, model, you have to calculate this numerically. But before doing so, we can go to some uh, analytic results. For example, we can study the asymptotic behavior of the one loop potential at the, at the large volume limit, 
which is T2 uh, goes to infinity. Actually, T2 is proportional to R square, so we take some radius going to infinity, or the volume of the torus to be very big. If we do so, then we get a very interesting result. We get one term which is proportional to 1 over T2 squared, and another term which is exponentially suppressed, and actually it's multiplied by Bessel functions which also don't fit in this uh, transparency. So, in uh, roughly speaking, we got a constant Xi, Nb minus Nf of T2 squared plus exponentially suppressed uh, terms. What is interesting is that these numbers is just the uh, number of uh, mesonic and fermionic uh, degrees of freedom. And uh, if you want to have a small topological constant, then this term is not enough. I mean, the suppression of T2 squared here is not enough because we know that the cosmological constant is very small. So even for, for big uh, moduli, the, the suppression is not sufficient. So this implies that if we want to have models which have uh, exponentially suppressed cosmological constant, we have to concentrate on models where the number of uh, fermionic degrees of freedom equals to the number of bosonic degrees of freedom. I have to explain these are not supersymmetric models. They are just models where the number of uh, degrees of freedom are equal. It doesn't mean the models are supersymmetric. And this is an analytic result. So people, and uh, especially our friend uh, Kostas Kunas, have made these models as a super no scale model. I, I don't know if the name is, uh, is appropriate. I would say they are models with fermion boson degeneracy. So motivated by this, I'm, not, I'm going now to consider some specific model. So I take... Uh, one of the very early GAT models, which was the Patisalan model. Actually, it was proposed in 1974 with the title Lepton Number as a Fourth uh, Color. This is a very nice title. Uh, and uh, I'm going to try to see if I, I can really obtain string models which have all these properties, all these nice properties, and they, they, they can be somehow. Uh, they can uh, exhibit the uh, Pati Salam uh, gauge image. Now, the Pati Salam uh, scenario, in the Pati Salam scenario, all the Sadar model fermions, they are assigned to a 16 of uh, SO10, which is actually a 4 of, uh, um, of SU4 with uh, 2 left and the 4 bar to right. So this is a very simple assignment. All the fermions are here, including the right kind of neutrino. And uh, the extra triplets, we can get extra triplets in the six of SU4. <coughs> and then we get the Salam um, Higgs scalars. These are the scalars required to break the Pati Salam uh, to the standard model. And we get automatically two standard model doublets. Uh, which are uh, accommodated in the back doublet of Pati Salam. So this is the simplest uh, Pati Salam scenario. Of course, in the context of string theory, we are going to get some extra states. And these are, uh, could be exotic states, which, for example, are the 411 of SU4 or the 121 or the 112 of SU2. This is what you can get in the context of string theory. You can get these states plus three ones that are exotic. And actually these exotics, they contain uh, fractionally charged uh, states and you have to see what I'm going to do with that. So our starting point is the three fermionic formulation of the heterotic string. In this context, all world system uh, bosonic worlds are fermionized except uh, space time. And uh, we use the standard notation. This is the standard notation for people who don't know. Okay, this looks a bit boring. These are the internal fermions, which uh, parameterize the three tori. And this is the right part, and this is the left part. And um, in this framework, a uh, model is defined by a set of basis vectors, which are called the parallel transportation properties of the fermionic fields along the non quadratable uh, loops of the world seed torus. And the set of faces, which are associated with DSO projections. So, roughly speaking, uh, in the free fermionic formulation, we can construct models 
uh, by just assigning faces to these uh, fermions and a set of faces with other GHO projections. So using the standard scenario, people perhaps don't know, I will use a fixed basis. And this basis uh, defines models with LU4, LU2 left, LU2 right, observable, plus this hidden gauge group. And I'm going to keep this basis fixed. And I'm going to allow all possible DGSO faces. And I'm going to scan all this spa to space to find models with desirable properties. Actually, naively speaking, this space contains uh, 10 to the 13 models. So, okay, we know that first and die string theory cannot uh, have uh, a lot of vacuum. So, uh, our deal is to, to find, uh, we're going to try to find some vacuum that uh, have all these properties we have uh, described before. So, in order to select among these vacuum, I'm going to impose a set of criteria. And I'm going to check if there is if there are any models that uh, meet all these criteria. The first is the absence of physical tachyons in the strict spectrum. As soon as we 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 quit the space-time supersymmetry, then there's no guarantee that the tachyons uh, appear in the strict spectrum, and one has to take care to project them out. The other is the existence of complete chiral fermion generations. And this type of partition lamb and standard model uh, symmetry breaking scalar Higgs fields. Uh, access of observable gauge group enhancements. This is something special that has to do with, um, with this construction. At special points, we can get enhancement of the gauge group. Then we have also the exotic states. And uh, in order to have the possibility to give them some masses, we ask that they are vector like. Another criterion is the consistency with sex fault uh, breaking mechanism. This is not trivial, and actually the calculation you have to do to write down the compatibility criteria is very long, and it doesn't fit in, uh, in 10 or perhaps 20 transparencies. But uh, actually, you have to, to assure this. You have to go to the ONDIFO formulation, make a correspondence between the ONDIFO and the fermionic formulation, and then try to go back to the fermionic and write down the criteria, which actually are have two pages of computer code to write them down. And then the most difficult is to compliance with a super no scale condition. That is, we have to find models where the fermionic, the number of fermionic degrees of freedom equals to the number of bosonic degrees of freedom without being super symmetric. So this is actually the most difficult uh, part of the story because here we don't have only the observable spectrum that takes part, but also the hidden spectrum. Takes part because they all are uh, all all degrees of freedom count in this. Uh... So we did that uh, using a computer scan over the full parameter space. It turns out that the full parameter space, okay, the naive counting is ten to the thirteen models, but if you do it a little bit more cleverly and you remove redundancy, you get about ten to the ten independent models. And uh, then we can uh, see that if we. We, we impose, uh, okay, criteria A to C, I have, I have split them in two parts. But if we impose all criteria, then we have about 5.6, 10 to the 5 models that uh, satisfy all criteria, including the super no scale condition. So we can get uh, Patisala models that they have clarity, they have directions. Of course, as you have noticed, the number of generation is four, is modulo four. This reason is that because we employ here um, complex fermions. We employ, we employ complex fermions in order to parameterize the lattice in a very, in a quite easy way and to make it uh, more uh, finite the calculation. There are, there are uh, under investigation ways to parameterize the lattice using real fermions. And then you can very easily reduce the number of generations to, to modulo three and so on. So this is not a technical problem, the, the number of generations. We get chirality, but we get modulo four number of generations. So uh, let's say uh, the models now we satisfy the, um, these, are, these are the models which satisfy the standard criteria, that is complete generation and so on. These are the models which satisfy uh, 
the super no scale condition. And finally, I'm going to talk to you about the models with uh, that uh, color. What I'm what we, we have been doing is that we have also calculated the one loop potential of these models. So of these 10 to the 5, uh, 5, 10 to the 5 models, we have calculated the one loop potential numerically. And these are the results. Actually, you have some uh, classes of models, and uh, there are more of them, but they are similar. And you have models where you have quality potential, like this one. Or you have models which the potential goes to negative and then goes back to positive. And there are models with completely negative potential. So I'm going to single out these models with positive potential. Of course, these are with respect to the modulus T2. Okay, there are other moduli, but this is the most important modulus. And uh, actually, this is the result of the numerical calculation. I'm going to show a typical model of class B. So in this class, uh, what could imagine that initially the modulus somehow lies at this, uh, this is the Planck scale, actually. And then for some reason, it rolls down towards uh, um, bigger ADA, where the cosmological constant will go automatically to zero, OK? So, how is it going to stop? This is a very interesting question. I think the previous speaker has some answer to this, uh, how this is going to stop, the roll down of the modulus. But at least we have some indication of how the, the, um, the modulus will, will be driven towards a uh, bigger uh, radii. The same is here, in this potential, you can see, and so we have models, so this is the class, the 10 to the 4 models actually, which also satisfy this, uh, have this property, that the potential is positive and somehow can drive uh, towards uh, a big radii and small cosmological constant. So these are the results of this exercise, and so let me give my conclusions. Uh, we have shown the existence of non-supersymmetric Pantisalan string models with the following properties. Spectra with realistic characteristics, uh, they have fermion chirality, Pantisalan and standard model Higgs scalars. They have Suzy breaking via the cess phase mechanism at scales which could be much lower than the Planck scale. Uh, they have uh, fermion boson degeneracy which is the so-called super no scale condition, that leads to exponentially small cosmological constant at large volume. And one has to examine more realistic configurations, employing perhaps real fermions, where you can reduce the number of generation and also you can reduce the, you can perhaps eliminate the exotic states. So, thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, Ignatius, the first question. The uh, plots that you showed, yes. uh, some of them with the effective potential have a minimum. Yes. Uh, what is the value? The, the value is at the self dual point. Ah, the self dual point. Yes. <laughs> so these are self dual actually with respect to one. Okay. So why you don't like this? Uh, the model is fixed at the self dual point because your logical constant is positive. Of course, it's a big, but no. Yes, because, uh, okay, let me say, okay. Examples of uh, the Cedar Vulcan. Yes, this is, uh, if they are stable, these are examples of the Sitter Vika. Okay, but now the question is the following, is that uh, if, for example, I'm in a potential like this, then I have uh, the modulus fixed here, but the Susie braiding is at the, uh, at the plant scale. Okay. But this scenario perhaps uh, could be something like metastable and can somehow drive the modulus towards uh, Big values. Okay, it's an indication, but uh, we have these uh, positive potentials uh, for sure. And actually, there is a big class of models that satisfies all the conditions. I mean, chirality, so on, so on, plus super no scale, plus positive potential. That is the result of this exercise. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Other questions 
or comments? There is a question on Zoom. Yeah, that's right. Let's check. Yeah, there is. Yeah, can, can I ask the question or? Question, request, we go. Yes, uh, very nice uh, talk, uh, Yanis. Uh, two quick questions. The first is, uh, what do you do? Are, are your models satisfy the Swamblam criteria or they present the explicit violations of them because they lead to the sitter? And second, what do you do with inflation? Yes, okay, this is the question we, <laughs> we haven't thought about inflation and so on. Perhaps this could be, I don't know, it's moving. This, uh, this could be interesting. One has to check really uh, if these models, uh, they are real, the uh, sitter vacuum. I mean, you have to switch on all the moduli and you have to prove that they are stable, okay? Right. But it's a very good indication that you, that you get, because the T2 modules we, we depict here is the, the most important modulus and goes to infinity. Uh, so, to my opinion, this is an indication that you have some decital vacuum, but one has to check actually that these are stable and you have to take into account all the other moduli. But this is a very difficult job because uh, you have to do every point here numerically, you know. And uh, you have to assure convergence, which means you have to take into account very big number of terms and you have to integrate them all and so on. So, for the moment, uh, this is an indication that we have to, to check uh, more carefully to see if there is uh, really there is some, some uh, more meaning there, if there are true decider models, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yes, but I always said, well, I don't have zero cosmological constant. In the third dual point. Yeah, okay. Well, it's a third dual point, then it's. it's uh, well, exactly the third dual point. We don't do computation. We have a infinite, but yeah, around the third dual point, you can do computation. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Uh, let's move on uh, to the next uh, speaker, who is Rocky Cole from University of Chicago. And Professor Kolb shall talk on the Gravitina Swampland conjecture. We are almost ready. Yeah. Take this one. Take this one. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. It just seems to be working. Maybe one more. Uh, that it'll work over here better. I can. I'm capable of pushing buttons. Yeah, no, yeah I, I can do it. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, so um, I'm very happy to be here. This is my first in-person conference since uh, BC. 
before COVID. So I'm, I'm very happy to be around with the friends and learning things here. So the title of the talk is The Gravitino Swampland Conjecture. And uh, let me say a word about swampland. Um, it's typically thought that if, a effect, if an effective field theory is in the swampland, it's bad because people think that swamps are really terrible. Now, I don't know if you have swamps in Greece. I don't think so, but I, uh... next. Okay, got it. I uh, was born and grew up in Louisiana when there are not hurricanes or even when there are hurricanes, there are swamps. And let me say a couple of nice words about swamps. Swamps, I think, have a beauty of their own uh, in spite of the fact that the animals who live there will either uh, sting, bite, or eat you. So if you stay away from those animals, the swamp is actually pretty nice. So, uh, my talk today is based upon two papers. Um, that were written with my collaborators, Andrew Long and uh, Evan McDonald. Andrew Long is a, a faculty member at Rice University in Houston. And Evan has just taken a faculty position at the University of Winnipeg, which I believe is very close to Canada. And there are two uh, papers, one of Long FISREV D paper and another a FISREV letter with the title Gravitino Swampland Conjecture. Um, they may have appeared already, I, I don't know. You know. We've gone through proofs and things like that. So they, they will soon be published. And there will be a few more papers on the way. So let me uh, say a word about the type of work that I like to do. It, Okay, good. Um, thank you. So, good. Now let's go on one more. Great. Um, the connection between high energy physics, sometimes known as inner space, and cosmology, often referred to as outer space, is a symbiotic relationship. What we learn from high energy physics gives us information about the cosmic microwave background fluctuations, large scale structure, et cetera. And what we learn about cosmology can limit particle properties and uh, limit model building in high energy physics. All right, so cosmology gives potential insight to high energy scales uh, and potential insight to theorists for model building, grand unified theory, SUSY, supergravity, et cetera. And again, um, high energy physics gives us information to try to understand the evolution of the universe. And um, today I'm going to use an aspect of what happens in the early universe, uh, namely that um, the expansion of the universe lifts particles from the vacuum, and this is known as gravitational particle production. So there are two ways that you might imagine um, producing new particles. One is the brutish way of smashing things together. That's what they do at the LHC. Or the refined way of using the expansion of the universe to produce new particles and study what happens. And the fact that the expansion of the universe can lead to particle creation, just the expansion of the universe, is something that's a little bit unfamiliar, I believe, to most people. What is familiar is something known as the Schwinger effect. And that is that if you have a strong electric field, 
you can uh, create particles from the quantum vacuum. Um, and uh, this was for, you know, it's known as the Schwinger effect, but of course, 20 years earlier, people had been mentioning it, and uh, Schwinger was the first person to do the reliable calculation. So the idea is, say, an, an electron and positron uh, comes out of the vacuum as virtual particles, but then they interact with the electric field, being pulled apart by the electric field, and um, if the particle, you can have particle creation, if the energy gained in an in acceleration from the electric field over the Compton wavelength of the electron exceeds the particle's rest mass. And if you put in the numbers, uh, the critical electric field is something like 10 to the 16 volts per, per centimeter. So it's nothing you can do in your basement. Uh, but nevertheless, Schwinger pointed out that uh, with, uh, in the presence of electric fields, the QCD vacuum is unstable and it will um, have a, a decay width proportional to e to the minus pi times e critical divided by e. Well, 10 to the 16 volts per centimeter seems like a lot, but uh, perhaps it can be obtained in. Um, uh, experiments with very high energy lasers. This is the cover of Nature a few years ago, and you can't read those little words up there, but it says physicists are planning lasers powerful enough to rip apart the fabric of space and time. So I'm not a violent person ripping across. The, uh, it's, things seem a little bit violent to me. Uh, as uh, Muro, who won the Nobel, which shared the Nobel Prize for high energy lasers, said, we're going to change the index of refraction of the vacuum and produce new particles. And uh, there's a prediction of when they will have what the high energy laser people call light materialization. And it stretches out to 2030. Uh, because you need a laser of a power of 10 to the 30 watts per square centimeter. Uh, they claim that they will have this in 1930s or the 1940s. Uh, if they have it in the 1950s, it'll be just about to be exciting, just about the time the LHC upgrades are done. Okay. Um, so it's very difficult to do this in the laboratory, but astronomy gives us the possibility of observing it. So if you have a large magnetic field, then you would have a comparably large electric field. And the critical magnetic field is five times 10 to the 13 gauss. Uh, but the core pulsar is a little bit below that and magnetars have a magnetic fields larger than that. So perhaps studying highly magnetized objects in astronomy, we would be able to directly see the Schwinger effect. Sorry? Right, but uh, if you have large magnetic fields, fluctuating large magnetic fields, you're going to have electric, uh, uh, flux large fluctuating magnetic fields, you're going to have electric fields also. Okay, so that's the point. So this is not a new idea. I believe it traces back to a paper by Schrodinger in 1939, October of 1939, and um, the title of the paper is The Proper Vibrations of the Expanding Universe. And it was uh, received and written in 1939 while Schrodinger was a refugee. And uh, it's sort of, it has sort of an interesting citation history. For the first 10 years, first 20 years after its publication, it was never cited, not even by Schrodinger. So of course, a funding agency would say this is a failed person and we should not fund this person anymore because he writes papers that no one uh, cites. But in the, you know, the citation number is going up exponentially with time as people uh, start to appreciate what's in this paper. So the expanding universe can lead to particle creation. Let's just look at this, an analogy of the simple thing I showed for the Schwinger mechanism. 
you have in the vacuum electron and positron pairs, and the electron and positron can be caught in the expansion of space. And you can have particle creation if the energy gain in acceleration from the expansion over a Compton wavelength exceeds the particle's rest mass. And uh, again, there is some critical expansion rate, instead of a critical electric field, a critical expansion rate, that's the mass of the particle. And you would expect uh, a production rate proportional to e to the minus pi um, times the h critical over h. Another way of imagining this is through quantum mechanics, the expansion of the universe causes an explicit time dependence in the action for what I will call spectator fields. So these are not fields that are responsible for driving the expansion of the universe. They're just sitting around a spectator field. And you can start with an initial approximately dissider uh, state at early times, like during inflation, and that vacuum may not evolve in Minkowski late time vacuum to the vacuum, but to an excited state populated by the particles. So an example, just a simple one dimensional example of how this might happen would be uh, the, the harmonic oscillator. And if you vary the spring constant slowly, adiabatically, you're not going to uh, change the level densities, but if you uh, change the spring constant non-adiabatically, then you will be promoted to an excited state. All right, so just scalar field theory gives us a simple example about how this might work. Uh, so let's couple a scalar field phi to gravity, and the coupling to gravity has something that's unknown that you can add as a dimension four operator involving the Ricci scalar R and with some coefficient C. If C is equal to one sixth, it's known as conformally coupled. And if C is equal to zero, it's minimally coupled. So working in conformal time related to the uh, scale factor, A is the FRW scale factor, the mode function satisfy a wave equation and the only unfamiliar thing about this simple wave equation is a time dependence to the scale factor and a possible time dependence to the Ricci curvature. So if you start with the wave equation, you can in, uh, in general write it as positive and negative frequency terms uh, in chi. The positive frequency term is proportional to uh, uh, a to alpha. And then the, the wave equations for A and B, alpha and beta are listed there. And you see that an initial condition would be alpha K equal to one and beta K equal to, that should be zero. I'm sorry, initial conditions are beta K equal to zero. And uh, a pure outgoing positive frequency solution would be a good solution if it is an adiabatic expansion. And there is a parameter that can be defined that tells you how non-adiabatic the expansion is. And that is the derivative of the uh, uh, derivative of omega divided by omega squared. If that is much less than one, then the expansion is adiabatic and particle creation will not be efficient. However, if the, um, Adiabaticity parameter is larger or comparable to one, then uh, you will be efficient at creating particles just by the expansion of the universe. So abrupt changes in the scale factor as a function of conformal time leads to non-adiabatic changes in omega, which adulterates in the words of Schrodinger, positive and negative frequency terms leading to Schrodinger's alarming phenomena of particle creation in the early universe. And this is sort of the last warm up slide. Uh, you can define the co-moving number density of particles at late times as an integral over the modes of beta of K squared. So it's just a Bogoyubov coefficient, a Bogoyubov transformation 
going from the initial de Sitter phase to the final Minkowski phase. So the program is to assume an initial adiabatic conditions that are true for inflation and solve the wave equation with initial conditions alpha squared equal to one and beta squared equal to zero. Then you will assume late time adiabatic conditions, which are true for FRW, and calculate beta k squared in terms of the frequencies and the, the wave, the mode function and its derivative. And uh, this is a graph for conformally coupled scalars of how beta k squared grows with time. You start off at A to equal to minus infinity in the descender phase. So inflation happens way out there. Then inflation ends and around the end of inflation for conformally coupled scalars, uh, beta of k squared oscillates and eventually going to a constant. But the constant that beta k squared goes to is not zero and that corresponds to particle production. So what you can do if you calculate beta of k, <clears throat> just beta of k squared gives you the number density. For instance, if you're creating a particle that will be dark matter, it would give you the number density of dark matter. So that's just the one point function. You can calculate the two point function and that leads to CMB isocurvature, which is potentially observable in the CMB. And the three point function leads to CMB non-Gaussianities. So my research program in recent years has consisted of trying to fill in this uh, diagram uh, calculating the one point function, two point function, and three point functions of uh, various spin fields, either scalars, conformal or minimal, Dirac fermion, um, spin equal to one, the Proker de Bois uh, action, and massive rugby to Schwinger fields, and uh, for spin three halves, and eventually massive uh, spin two particles for spin two. So today I will talk about this result, uh, looking at massive spin three halves, Robita Schwinger fields, and understanding its particle creation. So the first thing we want to do <clears throat> is adjust straight ahead Robita Schwinger fields. And uh, I realize not everyone has played around with Robita Schwinger fields. Um, Marita Schwinger wrote down the action in 1941, uh, but of course not in FRW. The uh, Marita Schwinger field is a vector spinner coming from direct products of a vector representation times the, the spinner representation. And part of these would be a spin three halves field with helicities plus one half and plus three halves. Um, now, higher spin fields are very difficult or tricky to work with because there's often pathologies that arise and you can go back to the 60s and read the papers of Steve Weinberg, <clears throat> Coleman Mandula, uh, Bull Aaron Zwenziger, et cetera. And uh, these complications involve potential superluminal propagation, wrong numbers of degrees of freedom, what could be worse than having the wrong number of degrees of freedom? Having the extra degree of freedom be a ghost. So, you know, you, you can run into a lot of trouble unless you're careful. Uh, many of these issues for spin three halves field were resolved in the context of supergravity by Das and Friedman. So the particular, particular interest in spin three halves field is that the natural spin three half field to consider would be the gravitino, which is the super partner of the graviton. The gravitino receives a mass from the super Higgs mechanism and there's also the Goldstino, an extra degree of freedom from uh, fermion in the chiral multiplet. Now in general, supergravity has torsion to and for Fermi interactions, et cetera. And we're, we have assumed that these extra complications are up at a higher scale. So we're looking at an effective field theory. 
So what we will find is that in some supergravity models, the gravitational mass is time dependent in FRW, um, or constant in other models. So now I want to talk about um, Rita Swinger or the Gravitino in FRW. There are some useful references uh, in 1999, 2000 or so. Uh, Giduce, Ryoto, and Tikachev wrote a paper calculating gravitational production of Gravitinos within a simple model at that time, as did Kolosh, Kaufman, Lindy, and then Froyan. <clears throat> and other people have looked at this, Hasegawa et al. And uh, the textbook I used to follow is Supergravity by Friedman and uh, Van Proyen. But what I'm going to do at first is start with a, the Rarita Schwinger action in FRW. Just to get that requires many steps that I won't show you the complication. Then to project the field into two propagating degrees of freedom with polarizations three halves and one half. So this is the, these are the field equations in FRW in such a model. And the three halves polarization looks exactly like a Dirac fermion. So the gravitational production of that has been calculated. However, the, the one half helicity does not look like a Dirac fermion. There, there's these uh, coefficients CA and CB that I would define on the next slide. So the spin, the helicity one half is a little bit complicated. The dispersion relation for the helicity one half is not just k squared plus m squared or k squared plus a squared m squared, but it involves these functions CA and CB. And CA and CB are complicated functions of the expansion rate H the um, Ricci scalar R, the mass, and also it, allowing the possibility that the mass changes with time. So this uh, square root of CA squared plus CB squared plays the role of the sound speed for the gravitino. So there's the uh, mode equation of uh, the um, Frequency omega k squared is cs squared k squared plus a squared m squared. And in FRW, the sound speed squared is related to the mass, the, uh, the, and the expansion rate, and the scalar curvature r. And in general, it will have a term that involves the derivative, how the um, field's mass, how the gravitino mass changes with time. And you can also write this uh, expression for the sound speed squared <clears throat> in terms of pressure and energy density, and uh, another term which involves the evolution of the mass. So first, let's take a constant mass, pure Rarita Schwinger, and uh, you can, if you do the calculation, you find that the sound speed vanishes if the pressure is equal to 3m squared m Planck squared. So that's not so hard to see up there. So it's possible that the sound speed can vanish. Uh, after inflation, the inflaton field presumably has damped oscillations about its minimum of the potential. So the oscillations in the pressure and the energy density will oscillate, eventually damping. This figure on the right is a graph of the pressure normalized by He squared, squared m Planck squared as a function of the scale factor divided by the scale factor at the end of inflation. So this equal to one is the end of inflation. And after inflation, the sound speed generally oscillates. So if the mass is constant, the sound speed will vanish if uh, m over he is less than about 0.4. So light mass gravitini, by light having a mass smaller than the expansion rate, uh, the sound speed will vanish. Here's some uh, figures showing the square of the sound speed as a function of the scale factor. And a over ae equal to one, 
corresponds to the end of inflation. And you see from light mass gravitinos, M, the sound speed squared will go to zero many, many, many times. If it's above 0.4, say if it's one, then the sound speed will not touch zero, but it will still drop. And if M over HE is say three, then uh, the sound speed only drops down to about 0.85, the sound speed squared. Now, if the sound speed goes to zero, then there is no extra energy needed to create high momentum modes. Uh, what else to have I said? I think I said everything here. HE is the expansion rate at the end of inflation. Alpha is the scale factor. AE is the scale factor at the end of inflation. And if M over HE is less than about 0.4, the sign sound speed will vanish in the evolution, potentially many times if M over HE is much smaller than 0.4. If M over HE is greater than 0.4, the sound speed doesn't vanish, but still can be less than unity. And if M over HE is much larger, say 10-ish or so, the sound speed remains approximately one. And in our cases, the square of the sound speed is smaller than one. Well, this, uh, these graphs show the frequency dependence, the K dependence in gravitational particle production um, and uh, as a function of that, what the number density, the mode density would be. So this is an example, and again, this is pure Rorita Schwinger uh, for elicity one half is pure Rita Schwinger, then uh, the sound speed for the helicity three halves reaches some maximum and then decreases. However, if the sound speed can be uh, go to zero, then the mode function will diverge for higher and higher momentum modes. And if, uh, if M over HE is larger than 0 0.4, here's an example where it's one, the helicity one half is still larger than the helicity three halves, but eventually, since it doesn't touch zero, it will uh, not blow up. So uh, I wanted to say about a word about these oscillations here. When I uh, wrote the code to do this calculation, I see all these crazy things that look like noise. And I spent a month trying to figure out what was wrong with my calculation. Then my collaborator pointed out that there's nothing wrong with my calculation. Those oscillations are seen in other calculations also. This is in the from the paper of uh, John G. Duce, Tony Riotto, and Igor Picacho. All right, so the vanishing sound speed leads to runaway production of particles, producing particles of arbitrarily large momentum. And you can see that from looking at the adiabaticity parameter that I defined, and it involves CS squared and CS. And if CS goes to zero and the derivative of CS goes to zero, then the adiabaticity parameter is simply H over M. So if M is small and the smaller the mass, the larger the adiabaticity parameter, the more gravitational particle production you would have. So if H is larger than the mass, one expects efficient particle production when CS and the derivative of the sound speed vanish independent of K. So you just pile up higher and higher momentum mode. And again, if the sound speed vanishes, there is no energy cost to produce momentum modes of arbitrarily large K. <laughs> and this is uh, shown here for the case of M over HE of 10 to the minus two. I show what the sound speed is there and uh, what the integral, uh, the integrated, uh, number, number density would be as a function of K. 
And this shows the evolution on the left-hand side. And you see, as soon as the sound speed vanishes, you can create particles of larger and larger momentum modes with no um, penalty. So the production of uh, production in models, production of arbitrarily high momentum particles will produce an infinite number density of particles if the mass is smaller than H, unless there could be a cutoff in the theory and, and regard Rita Schwinger as an effective field theory. If you do that, there's an infinite tower of irrelevant operators that are important near the cutoff. So it tells you that the breakdown of the EFT for momentum approximately equal to lambda. So that would be, if you regard the Rita Schwinger as an effective field theory, that would provide a cutoff. So if M is smaller than H, must oppose, impose an ad hoc UV cutoff on the Rita Schwinger models, and the Rita Schwinger model would not be consistent with effective field theory. Uh, but, a UV completion of our Rita Schwinger is in hand, and the most promising UV completion would be supergravity, where the Rita Schwinger field is identified with the Gravitino. Now, does supergravity tame runaway production? The answer is it depends. The runaway production would mean that the EFT is in the swampland. No runaway production, you would say EFT is in the landscape. So this is uh, sort of a picture of uh, how we imagine things to happen. At very small length scale, there are stringy things, strings, brains, what have you. And at some uh, scale lambda sub s, then this is converted to 10 dimensional supergravity plus other fields. And then there is a scale of, um, associated with the kaluza klein uh, to get to four dimension supergravity. And then supergravity is broken and we end up with what we normally uh, use in cosmology. So is there a swamp for four dimensional supergravity models? So if you look at four dimensional EFTs, some of them will be in the swampland if you have infinite particle creation, and some will be in the landscape. And there's only these uh, particles, the models that are in the landscape that are candidate models. So using gravitational particle production, we're going to try to see what the landscape is of the uh, N equal one, D equal to four supergravity. All right, um, a little bit of background for those who uh, may not work with supergravity. Supergravity relates, or Susie relates to graviton, uh, here represented by the field, field line. I guess in Italy, I should, in Greece, I should call it the tetrad, and uh, the gravitino field psi mu. So supersymmetry transformations mix up the gravitino and the uh, tetrad. So in addition to the um, uh, supergravity part, one assumes chiral superfields, phi, which contain a complex scalar, a chiral fermion, and auxiliary fields. And of course, you have the chiral superfields, you also have uh, the anti-chiral superfields. So the action is specified by a Kähler potential, which is a function of the field and its, and its complex conjugate, and supergravity of the super potential, which depends upon the uh, super multiplet. In the mix, there is a Goldsteino uh, defined here. And um, it is this. And in Susie breaking will happen if the derivative of the super potential is not equal to zero, then the gravitino will eat the Goldsteino. And just like in the uh, 
Higgs mechanism. But the gravitino mass in supersymmetry is in general time dependent. So we're gonna to have to take this time dependence into account. So if you just start with textbook, N equal one, D equal to four supergravity, and then build a model, you wanna specify the number of chiral superfields, specify the super potential and the Kähler potential. In general, uh, the time derivative of the gravitino mass is not equal to zero. And in general, the energy density and pressure depend upon the mass of the gravitino, and there are many models with many possibilities on the market. The first model that was looked at by uh, G. Duce et al. and Kawash et al. was supergravity around 1999, where there was, there was simple assumptions for the Kähler potential and the super potential. And again, remember the uh, expression for the sound speed squared. And what happens in the 1999 model with that Kähler potential and that super potential is that the time dependence of the gravitino mass canceled or compensated for the time dependence of the pressure term, that first term, and uh, CS squared would be zero. So that was the situation in the last century. In this century, several models have appeared, many models have appeared, several superfields, containing several superfields, and whether it's a runaway or not depends upon the number of superfields and also other fields in the effective field theory, like the Inflatino, and uh, I believe Dudas will talk about this on Sunday. And of course, it depends upon the gravitino mass divided by the expansion rate. Uh, I should note that Hasegawa was the first paper to notice the runaway with two superfields. And they, this collaboration just introduced an ad hoc uh, lambda, a UV cutoff. All right, so let's dig in a little bit to see why one superfield led to CS squared equal to one and others don't. Um, the criteria for the sound speed equal to one, what is that criteria? Well, this is a sound speed expressed in terms of the parameters of the supergravity model, the super potential and the Kähler potential. So here, although it's blocked a little bit, here there is uh, the sum over uh, the evolution of the of the um, scalar field that's in the chiral superfield and the derivative of the superpotential, uh, that squared minus the product. So one thing you can look at and say the sound speed will be one if the square of the sum is equal to the sum of the squares. That's pretty easy to arrange, particularly if you have only one superfield, the square, you have no sum to do. Otherwise, unless you have the square of the sum equal to the sum of the squares, the gravitino will be slow. And there was a paper back in uh, 2014 that pointed this out. And we can take a geometric view of the, of the calculation of the sound speed squared by defining some field in um, field space, that's the direction of the field space SUSY breaking, and the trajectory of phi uh, in the field space. So let's define phi dot f, these are vectors, as the magnitude of phi, magnitude of f times cosine theta. Then cs squared is the expression on the left-hand side. And you see that if the field space trajectory is perpendicular, is orthogonal to SUSY breaking, then cosine theta is equal to zero. And if the derivative of phi dot, if the derivative of phi is equal to the magnitude of F, then the sounds, the, the contribution will cancel and the sound speed will be one. So we can say that if you have a lonely gravitino, 
lonely meaning the gravitino is the only particle with mass below the cutoff of four dimensional supergravity. You can integrate out other particles and operators, et cetera, if, for instance, the inflatino. So the inflatino, if it's massive compared to the mass of the, um, of the gravitino, you could integrate it out. So we looked at some popular supergravity models. What makes them, um, every model is popular to the people who propose it. So there, there was a bunch of models. Everybody said these models are great. We looked at a bunch of them, uh, usually nil potent superfield models where S squared is equal to um, zero. And uh, this particular model is the effective field theory of KKLT with alpha attractors for inflation. The inflatino mass at the end of inflation um, is three M three halves. Alpha M Planck squared over two V squared is heavy and usually integrated out. And if you integrate out the other fields, you would find that again, uh, that the sound speed will vanish if the mass is smaller than the expansion rate. Then you can look at orthogonal constrained no potent superfields. And uh, depending upon the parameters of the model, CF squared, C the sound speed will vanish, leading to runaway production. So here is our statement of the Gravitino Swampland conjecture. And uh, the statement is, in all four-dimensional effective field theories that are low energy limits of quantum gravity, at all points in moduli space and for all internal initial conditions, the sound speed of the gravitinos must be non-vanishing. So if you have a field that has um, vanishing sound speed during inflation, you will produce an, a large number of them. In general, a theory of many interacting fields, the scalar sound speed CS should be understood as the determinant of the matrix of sound speeds of all fields kinematically coupled to the gravitino. And I believe Dudas will talk about this and with mass below the UV, cut, UV cutoff. And there still may be issues for slow, but not stopped gravitinos if VS squared is less than one, it could still be an important issue, even if it's not equal to zero. So that is the statement of the swampland, gravitino swampland conjecture. And uh, so another way of saying it is that supergravity EFTs with lonely constant mass gravitinos must have the mass smaller than the expansion rate. I have that back, backwards, must have the mass larger than HE. So there are implications for observations and experiment. If you assume a lonely constant mass gravitino in conventional thermal history, the mass must be larger than HE. This implies two things. One, if a gravitino is observed at terrestrial particle collider with a mass smaller than a TeV, then the cosmological experiments will never observe B mode polarization of the CMB generated by gravitational rays because the mass has to, HE has to be smaller than the mass. So if you see a gravitino at a terrestrial particle collider, you're saying that the mass uh, that the expansion rate during inflation must be smaller than the mass and smaller than a TeV would be pretty hard to arrange. On the other hand, if B-mode polarization from primordial gravitational waves is observed, then collider experiments will never see a gravitino. So with this assumption of a lonely, lonely constant mass gravitino in conventional thermal history, uh, it has an impact on observation and experiment. So that's uh, the conclusion of my talk on the Gravitino Swampland Conjecture at the 2021 workshop. And I will uh, tell you, want to remind you again of my collaborators, Andrew, Young, uh, Andrew Long and Evan McDonald. 
And what we're working on now is the gravitational production of massive spin two fields. And so in the 2022 workshop, I will come and talk about the standard, uh, about the gravitational particle production of massive spin two fields. And uh, that's my title for next year. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting talk. Questions, comments? Paul. So, Rocky, when you um, say that supergravity is the overwhelming completion, you are regarding supergravity as a sub subsumed into M theory, are you? Supergravity or supersymmetry? Supergravity. <laughs> so the, the motivation, our motivation for considering the, the spin three halves field comes from supergravity where there is a spin three halves field, the gravitino. Yeah, okay, no further questions, Apostolos. Right, so usually when you consider this gravitino production and compare with the models which deal with this gravitino over abundance problem, we give you some constraints, some relations, because we also have models which we could dilute gravitinos with different mechanisms. Yeah, so uh, the yeah. other stable particles will decay late and somehow. Uh, so that's. Uh, yeah. So I did say a standard thermal history, I believe somewhere. So, you know, you can always muck around with the thermal history or, you know, okay, you can change the thermal history is one easy way of doing things. You're right. Thank you. Uh, well, okay, next question from the lecture room. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. He's working. Okay, uh, I was asking, if you have a uh, conformally coupled scalar, you're going to get an anomaly, right? If I have what, sorry? You're going to get an anomaly for a conformally coupled scalar. So there is a kind of back reaction to gravity due to the one with uh, and scalar from inside, right? So I did physically introduce the volatile terms like gauss Gounet or uh, right tensor squared and so on. And I even considered this contribution as well. Or? So adding, if you have a non-conformal coupling. Conformal, conformal coupling. We're talking about conformal coupling. Right, so right. From a conformal theory, it's better as you did. And then from just one of the correction, you get a conformal anomaly, which should back react some gravity. So the stress energy tends to rest on one. Well, we haven't considered that. We're just working with typical supergravity models um, that come from uh, string theory, so there's a conformal symmetry lurking around there, uh, but conformal symmetry must be broken, and we're assuming it's broken at this at this stage. But th th those are irrelevant operators, right? So it's suppressed by some large scale. So you'd have to ask what is in the effective field theory? Okay. Yeah, I'd like to understand the, in the h conjecture conjecture that you mentioned the mass, uh, what you call mass for the gravity is the Lagrangian mass. Is all the time depends on the, let's say, the physical mass of the state, no? It is the uh, time, it is the time dependent mass. For instance, if you take the city space uh, and you take um, uh, the massless direct operator, that has no zero mass because there is a contribution to the mass that comes from the carrier too. That's good thing. So we um, do not work in De Sitter space. All the action happens 
either close to or the end of the of inflation, where the time derivative of H becomes important compared to H, and you're no longer in disitter space. Uh, but the conjecture concerns the uh, Lagrange mass. Yes. Because there is a, a simple supergravity model written by Friedman a long time ago, in which uh, the uh, gravitino Lagrange mass is vanishing. The cosmological constant is being zero. Uh, Supersymmetry is broken because there is a U1 uh, field that breaks. I mean, that uh, plays a uh, new roughness thing. So, um, sorry, did you say the gravitino is massless? Yeah, it's uh, uh, the gravity mass is zero. Uh, there is no superpotential. Supersymmetry is broken by a deep one. And uh, there are two fermions. There is a gold steamer. Uh, and the uh, uh, so the uh, if you compute in that in that theory the the, the mass matrix uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you find that the dispersion relation has a uh, uh, determining line what's the, the what you call the sound speed as well. Mm -hmm. Right. So I would say that that model is in the landscape. That's what you, yeah, that's what I my question. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, the advantage of having the swampland conjecture is it gives you some idea whether the model you're working on, uh, working within the framework of some model, is consistent or not, or do you have to include higher dimensional operators or other complications? But in this model, the spot of sound is one. Okay. Okay, we, we have a question from the remote audience. Nikos, would you yes. like? V very nice uh, talk and oh. approach. Uh, I would like to ask a question on the gauged uh, supergravity. If you have gauged uh, supergravities, is your conjecture going to be modified in the sense of the speed of the gravitino is going to change? or that, That's the question. I don't think so. So mm -hmm. when you say supergravity is gauged, what exactly do you mean by that? Well, you have extra gauge fields, uh, you know, yeah, extra... Gauged in, in some sense. You know, the, the gravitino is uh, mixed up with the graviton and this chiral superfields and things That's like right. that. And there are gauge fields, the, the gauge genos and whatever, yeah. So you have extra th fields in the spectrum for... Uh, but you you think but probably, as you say, is is going to be only the gravity sector that... Uh, that uh, plays that role for your conjecture, I guess. Well, it assumes that other fields are um, at a higher scale, and the, we're just looking at the effective field theory. Right. And if, you know, it's embedded in some other theory, but the effective field theory is what we're looking at. Okay. And the effective field, field theory assumes that all the other excitations have been integrated out. Right. Thank you. Okay, so a follow up question. Yeah, I mean, my earlier question, what I really meant was. Hold, hold the microphone a little bit closer, please. It's all right, just hold it closer to your mouth. In my earlier question, what I really meant was that an uh, ultraviolet completion must be finite. And as far as I know, no supergravity is known to be finite. What, but this was a restriction for gravitational, a finite amount of gravitational particle production. So if, this, if you just look at Rarita Schwinger, then once you start producing particles, then you produce arbitrarily high momentum fields, but you can only imagine this up to some cutoff because there are derivative interactions and things like that are suppressed. So you can't produce particles of momentum, arbitrarily high momentum at the cutoff or above. Uh, Paul, that, well, I, I gave a great brilliant answer. I'm not sure it's the answer to the question you asked. So maybe we should discuss it at coffee. It's a phenomenological answer to a formal question. Well, okay, so let's continue this part of the discussion afterwards. Uh, if there are no further questions, then let's thank uh, Rocky again for his thank you. inspiring text. Let's take a break.